All right, I really promise, I think this is the last video for today. But after the sort of six to eight minute video that aired that was released earlier today about the design process behind the Wild Beyond the Witchlight, during D&D Live 2021, Mika Burton had about maybe 15, 20 minutes with Chris Perkins to discuss things further. And there was some actually really useful and different information that I could glean from that that I had not seen discussed anywhere else. I did want to go back to that video, though, to show you a couple of things to show off some art pieces we hadn't seen. Like this owl bear coach I thought is pretty cool. I hadn't seen this going around anywhere on the internet. Uh, and there's a lot of really nice art throughout the book. Also, I really love the sort of neon style posters in the background showing off some of the classic D&D designs. But it's this one that I wanted to show you. So when she's describing, I, I want to say it's a, is it Kate Irwin's describing, the art director is describing she asked for a bunch of adventures hanging off of a swamp light balloon. Now, clearly the dragonborn, maybe this human or elf, and I guess maybe a halfling here are adventurers. Is this frog person an adventurer? I don't think so. I think he's maybe a denizen of the Feywild. But this is not a grung, my friends. This is a bullfrog style or a green frog style person, more bullywug. Uh, although it does look like maybe the dragonborn's trying to chop at him and he's pushing this guy off who's holding onto him. Could this be a player character? I don't think so, because we don't have any reference to those coming in the book. But either way, I thought it was pretty cool. And if we kind of move forward, you can see here's where Chris is talking to Mika Burton. And I'm going to let this run in the background while I talk over it in case the art comes up and it's interesting. But uh, what did we get? Well, first of all, uh, actually, you know what? I think I'm going to pause it and I'll talk to you. And we'll come back if I find some interesting or I'll let it play in the background. But uh, he said that because this is a Feywild adventure, and if you don't know, they kind of tied Ravenloft sort of to the um, pseudo to the Shadowfell. So he said that the Wild Beyond the Witchlight is sort of a direct reflection or almost an antithesis of Curse of Strahd, which is a domain of dread, which is all dark and spooky. And this is kind of the opposite, uh, which is a domain of delight. We've heard this term before. And rather than being run by a Dark Lord, it's run by an Arch Fey. So that's kind of the how that works. Uh, and they talk a little bit about how things in the Feywild, specifically the emotions, uh, emotional states in the Feywild, are super powerful. For example, the Archfey, their emotions can shape the realm to a greater degree if they're feeling sad or happy or however it might be. But even the lowliest creature can shape it. He references, Chris Perkins references, um, a goblin child crying under a tree because she's sad and it makes like a flower sprout or something like that. Or she smiles because she had a great sandwich and it makes it like a smiley, happy flower. Something like that. And like to that degree, the emotions are important. So then there's this image, which is pretty sweet, which is apparently the Witchlight Carnival arriving. Uh, and those are apparently small style creatures, Mr. Witch and Mr. Light. But look at this. This is a pegasi, but with fairy butterfly wings. Um, and he said there's a variety of different interesting fairy creatures. Uh, and yeah, so this butterfly pegasus, but this is a small creature pulling a small cart because it looks like to me, if you look at the, I don't know, it might be forced perspective, but Chris said they're tiny creatures if you look at uh, what's going on there. So then Mika Burton goes on to say, uh, can I ride one of those? And Chris says, if you look around enough when you cross over into the Feywild, you can find a variety of different creatures you could ride. For example, giant dragonflies, giant cranes, I'm assuming as in the bird. Uh, and a gargantuan size owl. So very neat stuff. Uh, and then he goes on a little bit more to talk about the map. They show off the map of the, um, let's see if I can find it here. Comes up a little bit after. Uh, the map that we're gonna get the smaller version of in the Dyson Miscellany. There's a full poster map that will be contained within uh, the back of the book. I think it's gonna probably be perforated. You can tear it out. And it actually has interactive parts to the map. So it shows the whole carnival on the one side. And we kind of saw it again in the Dyson Miscellany. The top left is for the passage of time. The bottom right is for the mood of the carnival, the overall mood of the carnival. Because I guess tracking and passage of time is super, here it is, is super important too. So here you can see um, up here in the corner, this sort of hourglass thing. And it says the fun of the Feywild for all the family. Welcome gifts, big top extravaganza, and crowning of the Witchlight Monarch. You can see there's this time passage here. And down the bottom it says, will you be the Witchlight Monarch? And you can see there are different sort of drama style masks here. Apparently entry without a ticket is strictly prohibited. And it says, have a delightful time over here. 
a night filled with wonder and so on. You can see there's a lot of interesting stuff posted around it. But apparently, yeah, time is a super important aspect of this. I do think it's very interesting to me that we have seen a lot of things recently in pop culture about multiverses and time travel and time-related things, and now it's supplanting in our D&D game, um, which is fine. It's just an interesting social commentary. So yeah, passage of time and time in general is super important because I gather, and it was kind of alluded to, that time passes differently in the Feywild, and I don't know if this is one of those things where like, if things are going well, time slows down, but if people are starting to dive in and try to like look into things they shouldn't be, time speeds up to get to the end of the carnival. And again, apparently the mood is important as your parties, either triumphs or shenanigans or what have you, can impact the overall mood of the carnival as a whole, which I thought was kind of interesting. All right, so moving on, what else do we have? Uh, I'm going to see if I can get to the piece of art. I and mean, you might have seen it before, but there is a displacer beast kitten, apparently. That's as part of this adventure. It is named Star, uh, is the name of this Displacer Beast Kitten. And apparently you can catch up and befriend this Displacer Beast Kitten uh, and have it as an ally for you in your adventures in the Feywild. I don't know what degree there are rules. I don't know if this is technically going to be considered a sidekick as per the sidekick rules. But apparently, Chris also goes on to say there are a ton of really interesting and cute creatures contained within this book that you can then possibly befriend. Uh, there is a piece of art that I'll show you right here. This is a palace, apparently called the Palace of Heart's Desire. And this is where the Archfey of Prismere, the sort of leader of the realm you're going to in this book, this is where they live. This is their abode. So apparently at some point you may be visiting the Archfey of Prismere. Um, I would guess if they're gonna have this art. And I kind of dig in the sort of, I don't know, the spooky, weird, garden kind of pulling down the towers i think that that's pretty sweet so yeah apparently there'll be that this is mr witch and mr light the two purveyors of the carnival and chris would not talk about where this portal went it is a blue portal i don't know if that has anything to do with the dream of the blue veil spell uh but that's pretty interesting and he would not go into further detail about that so maybe we'll learn some interesting stuff about it when the book actually launches and here it is so you can see a little owl folk. This guy's got a spider friend, but here is the displacer beast kitten named Star, who again runs off, I guess, as part of this, and you can track them down and then befriend them and then add them to your team. Again, I don't know if it's gonna grow fast and then you can have it as part of the party or how that works exactly, uh, but I thought that, that was interesting. And then he also goes on to talk about the two new races. Mika asks him about that. And he says the two races are the fairy and the heron gone which uh, they were both the Unearthed Arcana versions. The fairy sounds like it's remaining largely the same, although nothing was officially commented on, and that the rabid folk name was changed to Herengon, which is a playoff of the term Herengon, because they move around so quickly. There you go, folks. That's all the notes I was able to take. Uh, again, September is not that far away. We'll have this book in hand, and we can dive through this individually, and I'll go through and do my normal coverage of D&D books as I usually do. So if you like this kind of content, news coverage, again, be, be sure to stay tuned as tomorrow I'll be probably doing another video like this, commenting on what was discussed in the live stream where we talk further about Strixhaven and maybe we find out whether or not those subclasses actually do arrive or not. So thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you all next time.